Uh, so welcome to the presentation. Uh, we'll, we'll make a quick presentation of Fring. Fring which is a decentralized communication uh, platform. It allows for um, audio, video, and text messaging in a decentralized manner. Fring is developed by a free software co consulting company in Montreal called Solfa Linux, where both me and Simon work. Yes, um, so my name is Simon, this is uh, Alexandre. So during the talk, we'll go over Ring's distributed peer-to-peer -peer architecture and explain how we managed to make a call and calls and um, transfer text messages in a decentralized manner. Then we will go some security and privacy concerns and finally have a look at new up and upcoming features such as multi-device and a username registry using a blockchain. Finally, we'll have a look at the um, available clients. First, let's do a small demonstration. Um, all right, so on your right you will see um, a camera for the Android phone. Okay. So when you uh, just download the app on FDroid, as you see, uh, you can find it on FDroid. Uh, if I just show you, uh, ring. it's not the first in the list, but you can somehow find it. You just go. So what I did here on my computer is I've created an account. What a ring account is, is it's, it's an RSA key pair. And the, the ID that you see here okay. actually contains my public key. So now small, small can scan this QR code and send a message to me. Okay, so now when you will start a ring on Android, you will see the screen. And then you can just create a ring account. And then the time it takes to create the account is actually the time uh, for generating uh, a pair of RSA keys. keys. Um, so it takes a little, little time. And once it's done, now you can use your phone to um, scan a QR code when you have a friend that is just nearby. Just scan the code. All right. And then once it's scanned, you have this uh, you jump in a conversation in which you can write uh, some text. So <laughs> click. Yeah, we could. Click yeah, yeah. right on. <laughs> so now, Zetem is sent, and as you can see, he has received uh, the message, and all of this is um, being ex exchanged uh, through a distributed hash table. So we don't have any connection between us for now. Um, so. If we want to uh, instantiate the... I'm calling you already. Uh, you're already calling me. All Thank right. you. So some... I should receive your call in any time. <laughs> in any time. I, okay, you have my... Right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how calls work for later. Uh, um, Maybe, maybe you can try calling me. I don't know if you have a good connection to the okay. Wi-Fi. I can do that. Or else I always have another um, Android phone. Oh, yeah. Oops. It did, it did work. So I did receive a call. I could not make it. Um, I won't try and fight against the Wi-Fi and instead go over with the explanation right. of what happened here. Um, before you understand how ring calls work, uh, you need to understand what a ring ID is, and I've already explained it. It's a pair of RSA keys, and it's your public identity on the network. Um, your ring ID is meant to be public, and it contains no private information other than your public key. So now let's jump in in uh, some explanation of what the distributed hash table is. So first, um, we wanted to make some dis distinction between two, uh, three types of uh, networks. So at first, we have the centralized network, which we all know. It's all of your Google and YouTube and all of that. Uh, you have the federated network um, and the distributed network. So out of curiosity here, who could name me maybe a federated network? Any, anyone? What? Identica. Identica. Yeah. I don't. I don't know that, but okay. Uh, now I know. Uh, there, there's an easy. There's an easy one. You. You know, mail. Mail. You know, 
mail. And uh, if you know uh, Diaspora, which is a kind of a Facebook, Twitter, but this is a, this is a federated network uh, in which you can choose for your um, your um, your pod, the pod which is the, the central server you use to connect to the whole network. Um, but this is not yet distributed. And um, Ring Ring is a software that wanted to uh, bring distributed network a reality for everyone to communicate. Uh, so if you want to differentiate between the federated network and distributed network, well, every node in a distributed network is equivalent to another, another node. So um, yeah, this is the special thing about this. So what makes us um, able to do that is uh, OpenDHT. OpenDHT is the distributed hash table we use. Um, for those of you who don't know what a distributed hash table is, we'll just walk you through um, the process of what it does. But uh, in short, this is some tool that will allow you to um, distribute some load of, of that data storage over a network. So uh, it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty efficient and pretty um, useful. Um, so uh, in the network, every node has an ID which is of length uh, 160 bits. And we use those IDs to uh, compute the distance between each of them using the XOR metric. Uh, this is a sort of um, abstract distance, which, uh, which is uh, uh, computed yet again using the XOR metric. Um, and yes, there are other um, distributed hash table that exist already, but we wanted to have some specific features, such as the listen feature, which will uh, enable uh, each node to be notificated uh, on new data storage. Uh, we also implemented uh, uh, some powerful queries, allowing you to fetch partial data, partial set of data on the network, which could um, uh, reduce the, the traffic the traffic we, we get using the, the distributed hash table. And also uh, some feature that is a work in progress, we have uh, the value indexation over the DHT. Um, so yeah, if you want to contribute, if you want to know if you, um, any more things about uh, the, the, the project Open DHT or in order to provide a patch, you can, uh, you can uh, do, do so on, uh, on GitHub. Here's the link. So just, just to show you what's the process behind a distributed hash table, we'll just start here by uh, looking at, at, this, at the circle where you have the, the key space. Every, every key, every ID, which is the same thing, um, will, be, um, will be on this circle. And when some Alice want to uh, communicate with uh, anyone or just use the, the distributed, distributed hash table, she first has to know a first node. And once she knows a first node, which is here the, the node that is uh, labeled by the, the key ID uh, A10 uh, dot 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 uh, F4C, she just asks to that node, uh, which are the list of, which is the, what is the list of nodes that is the closest to uh, the ID I am looking for. And on the screen, you can see that the ID uh, Alice is looking for is actually 002K5P, uh, represented by the sort of mailbox. And so then the first node will just say, oh, I know, uh, I know uh, some ID that is uh, closer to the, the target you're looking for. And here, here it is. And then we ask again and then again, and we will eventually find the closest node to the, to the, the target we're looking for. And once we have um, found this, this closest node, we can uh, just uh, uh, exchange data between, uh, between uh, this node and, and us. Uh, some operation uh, that are um, available to use in the distributed hash table are such as uh, the get, get operation for getting data and put for putting data. And we have also, as we, um, we've talked to you uh, just before, 
um, the listen, the listen which helps another um, another node in the network to be notified if, for instance, um, Alice were to uh, to put some data on the mailbox of uh, Bob. So that's the way we we exchange some some data on the distributed hash table. So one big issue with uh, communicating uh, in peer-to-peer -peer network is creating uh, connections with one another. One another. This is not always possible because uh, we have uh, NAT and firewall issues. So uh, Ring has to implement a number of methods to try to uh, to go through a NAT or a firewall. Uh, it, there is several methods that Ring tries, and it tries them in order in order to establish a connection in the best way possible. So um, obviously, like the, the class in the cla in a classic situation, um, Alice could be could have a pu public IP address, and Bob could be on a private network. In this case, it might not be possible for Alice to contact Bob because he has a, a, a private IP and he might not have configured his firewall to let Alice in. So in this case, she cannot send any packets to him, but he can contact her. Um, in, in this situation here, um, only Bob is able to make calls to Alice. Uh, but it can get even worse where uh, both of them are behind the firewall that they don't control. This means that uh, neither Bob nor Alice is able to instantiate a call. And uh, in this situation, uh, there is nothing we can do. Um, most most home home routers allow for uh, UPnP, which means that you will open ports on your on your on your machine, and then you can make calls. But your your IP changes all the time, and of course, you don't want to communicate with your IP with friends. It's it's not convenient to share to open connections that way. So. Um, other, other techniques, uh, techniques we can use to make a wire, NAT and firewall transversal is stun. So if you have a router that does not cooperate with you, meaning that he does not want to tell you what your public IP is, then you could ask someone else on the internet, which is a, what we call a stun server. And this stun server will answer to the, to the following question, what is my one IP? When he tells it to you, then you can, you can tell it to your friends, and they might be able to call you there. Um, this does not solve all issues because you could still have a firewall and packets won't go in. Um, so if that does not work, you can, re you can revert to using a turn server. What a turn server is, is a point on the internet where both parties can connect that will relay all packets. Uh, this means that you need a server somewhere that is willing to relay all your traffic. So your, the call quality might be degraded or... Um, yeah, it's a, it's a less convenient situation. Um, the, so what we use for, for this is a protocol called ICE. So essentially what ICE does is, is Alice will tell Bob all the possible ways she thinks she can be contacted, and he will do the same. Then they will create a, mat a matrix of, of possible ways they could talk to each other, try them all, and then, and then order the working ones and pick the best. Um, the, way, the way this works with OpenDHT is simple. Uh, so all this time, I've assumed that Bob can already talk to Alice without even having a connection open. The, the way this works is they use OpenDHT. Uh, by with in, inside the DHT, both Bob and Alice have what we call a mailbox. Like somewhere, somewhere you can send messages and they will notice. So Bob is listening to the top, in, the top right mailbox. And if Alice wants to make a call, she will just put a message here. This message is encrypted for only Bob to see, and Bob is, is, is subscribed to this mailbox. So as soon as this message arrives, he will receive it. What this message says is, hello, I'm Alice. I want to make a call to you, and these are the possible ways you could try to contact me. Now Bob's, Bob wants to answer the call, so he will do the same. He will send a message to Alice's mailbox. She will be notified, and what this message says is, yes, I want to make a call with you, and her, here are the possible ways you could try contacting me. Now, as of, this very, as, as of this very moment, Alice tries to contact Bob in every possible way with every possible like, meanings of connection she has. Now they both discover what is the best way to talk to each other, and they have a call. Um, so this is how we establish calls in Ring. Um, now there is the issue that you might not have access to a stun server. Well, a stun server is pretty easy because they're available for free on the internet because they don't do anything much. They don't require much bandwidth. But then turn servers, it's, it's a bit more of an issue because you have to set one up if it's not possible to make calls in any other way. Um, 
we are looking into ways to solve this, such as pools of turn server contributed to the, by the community. But in general, you should be able to make calls using just UPnP. Um, so from top to bottom, all of the messages that were exchanged between Alice and Bob are all encrypted. Um, first of all, the, your, the ring ID contains a pair, a, a RSA key pair that can be used to encrypt messages. So it's all encrypted on the OpenDHD network. And then calls in a ring are instantiated using SIP. So we are compatible with whatever cell phone you have. And um, so we leverage this existing standard. Same thing for audio. Now, the, there is the issue that, that we face that a ring ID is connected to a device. It's connected to a node on the network. So you might, you might not find this practical because when you're used to those non-free solutions, right, you can just call a username and then it's going to ring whether he's on his laptop, on his cell phone, or, or whatever. Um, so what we do is we, this is an up and coming feature, by the way, but it is not yet merged. Um, Alice will sign, will sign devices. And now you can know that these devices are owned by Alice. Whenever you want to make a call, you will make a call to all of Alice's devices, and she will answer on only one. This allows for Alice to, um, to uh, revoke, revoke a device that, she's, that was stolen and not have to redo her whole identity again. So this means that somewhere, somewhere on the network, Alice, Alice has to put the list of devices she owns. So um, she, will, she will put information on the DHD network saying, so these are my devices. When you call me, call me there. Uh, and the, the way it works right now is only you have only one device, as you can see on the right. Um, so more features that are, are coming to Ring are, um, are the issue that like, Ring IDs are not easy to share. They are long hashes, complicated, like you, you won't ever remember it, so you have to scan it with a QR code or send it to you via email. Um, instead, we would like to propose a solution, which is, uh, which is building a decentralized registrar. So uh, what we are working on is an Ethereum contract. Uh, I won't go in depth about explaining how Ethereum works, but Ethereum, essentially what it does, it, is it allows you to write decentralized apps. So you have a program that runs in a decentralized manner all over the internet. What we will build is a program that registers his username. So you can talk to him and say, I want to register this username to this ring ID. And he'll say, yes, he'll remember it forever. Um, but, but now there is the issue that not all, not all ring nodes are willing to run this, this potentially heavy Ethereum node. So what we are building also is a Lightrest API that will, that anyone could run on his own server, for example, or us, we could run it for the community that will do the registrations for you, so talking to Ethereum for you. This is always going to be optional in the ring because it, is, it will always be possible to call a ring ID directly instead of calling a username. But uh, we will have a solution for, decentralized u for a decentralized username registry. Uh, it's interesting, uh, especially since we're here at DevConf, like everyone has probably a PGP key, which is a 4096-bit RSA key pair. Um, we could imagine generating those keys from exist ex existing PGP keys. So from, from the w we could leverage the, the usage of the, web, the existing web of trust to, to know who's like what Alice's ring ID would be, since I already know her PGP key. Um, so uh, if you want to see the source course, source code, or contribute to Ring, you can always find us on our uh, Garrett server. And uh, yeah, uh, now available clients. We, all of our clients are, are open source, even on other free platforms. So uh, we, uh, we already have a working client in Debian that is in the repositories as of this week. So you can type apt-get install Ring right now. If you're using another distro, we have uh, repositories. Our apps are available on both FDroid and the Google Play Store, and you can download the apps for the other platforms on our website. Yeah, join the ring. <laughs> if you have any questions, um, any technical questions, you can handle them. Yeah. Two, one, 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 one. Yeah, it works. Um, so it relies on a fleet of nodes. 
Yes. Uh, does that imply that only the the phones that are out there that have a ring installed uh, participate in that fleet, or does does that imply that you need some of the servers on the internet to act as basically inactive or unanswering nodes? And if that is the case, can we help? All of the all of the ring clients are joining are joining the OpenDHT network. So by default, you are you are a node. Yeah. So yeah, we have hundreds of nodes already running all over the internet. And the more, so you can see the, the answer. Uh, is my mic on? Yeah. Uh, uh, the more the more the network is big, the more the network is uh, is healthy. So uh, yes, you could also uh, run. Well, the community could also run some uh, some nodes on some on some machines uh, anywhere, and you can run multiple nodes on on the on, on the same machine. So. Um, but yeah, that's how the that's that's what uh, the the ring is based on. Yeah. For the first time, you will boot your client. You will you will have to know one existing node of the network, right? This is called a bootstrap node. Um, what we do at Sawapa Linux is we host a we host a bootstrap node at bootstrap.ring.cx. But what we plan to do is to instead ship ring with a list of community maintained servers, so that you would not have to like. Trusts of Alpha Linux to host the, the first node. It's already configurable, configurable in your client. You could put any node there. You don't have to use ours to get bootstrapped. And whenever you restart your client, it won't use the bootstrap node anyways. Uh, I think uh, Tom? Just on the uh, it's answered. All right. I want to know how you get into the network. Yeah, you have to know a node. Any other question? I think we're done. All right. Thank you.